Well, good morning and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Fred Rogers with Continuity Housing. Today's presentation covers a synergistic approach to successfully preparing for and managing deployment of your organization's critical personnel, not only to a reliable and comfortable workspace in your failover city, but also to ensure guaranteed housing in comfortable pre-approved hotels. As we watch the historic flooding in New Mexico and Colorado, we're reminded that always being prepared to work and be housed in a dependable alternate location isn't a luxury, it's an absolute necessity. Today we'll be analyzing how a company with headquarters in Houston can successfully, efficiently, and comfortably deploy 50 or more of their critical employees to their failover city of Dallas because of an impending landfall of a Category 3 hurricane near Galveston. At issue is what the expectations are not only of the deployment planners and organizers, but also of the deployed personnel themselves in the event of an away mission, the logistics of which have been pre-planned and established well in advance for optimal productivity from that staff as the result of a well-prepared environment both day and night. Presenting today on behalf of Continuity Housing is Michelle Lather. After spending 16 years in hotel sales and operations, Michelle created an innovative patent-pending method for securing guaranteed rooms for organizations' critical personnel in the event of a crisis. She's managed deployments since 2006 from a 50-person recovery for a smaller company to the Deepwater Horizon incident in the Gulf of Mexico, and she has a 100% success rate in securing deployment housing for her clients. Michelle's many years in the hotel industry make her a strong advocate for her clients, and her expertise in business continuity housing and hotel contracting make her a sought-after resource and a popular speaker. But first, we'll be hearing from Stephen O'Neill of Varensis Recovery Services. Stephen's the former operations manager and now solutions development manager for College Station, Texas-based Rinses Recovery Services. Stephen's responsible for developing and executing industry-leading recovery solutions for various businesses that have experienced disasters, and he has over 13 years of hands-on experience in recovering companies from large and small disasters. So, Stephen, let's get started. Thanks, Fred. Good morning, everyone. I know uh, this next slide will probably be familiar to a few people. You've already been staring at this, I'm sure. Um, some people have seen the disturbance that's uh, brewing in the Gulf and wondering where it's going to go. And I love this map. Isn't this great? It gives us a great, uh, this isn't even the cone of uncertainty. Uh, I guess it's the, the spider web of uncertainty. They don't know where this thing's going to go or what it'll be. But when this thing pops up, of course, you probably start questioning or asking some questions. Um, or upper management comes to you and says, okay, where are we going to go? and hopefully you have a plan or you've got some sort of plan. Um, the next question is, you know, what resources will we have available? Um, meaning, are you going to have laptops? Will you have printers? Will you have uh, office supplies? Uh, things like that. When can we get the business back up and running? So our plan is to go to another location. Well, how quickly will things get back up and running? Uh, the CEO wants to know when will he be able to make that call to sales or make that call to the number one customer and say, you're fine, we're okay. And then, of course, the big one is, okay, how can we minimize costs? Now, I know you've probably been trying all year long saying, hey, we need a plan, we need to do this, we need to get something going. But upper management may, in some cases, be saying, oh, no, uh, you know, it hardly ever happens, we'll be okay. So. And, and the reason they do that, obviously, is they, they don't want to spend the money. They want to minimize those costs. Uh, um, so is there a solution that can do all of these, minimize that cost, uh, and provide you a key piece, which is flexibility? And there is. But most people, when they have this scenario staring them at them in the face, they say, okay, magically we're going to go to a hotel. And they believe that they'll be able to call up their favorite hotel chain and say, hey, I'm going to bring probably 40 people, and we'd like to use your conference room, and we'd like to, you know, have some rooms available. And there are some hotel pitfalls with that, and Michelle is going to educate you a lot more on those. But from obvious perspective, room availability, a lot of people think, oh, my best buddy Bob uh, at the hotel, he's a good friend of mine. You know, he's always told me he'll hook us up. But what some people forget is that Bob's job is to be everybody's friend. And when everybody calls Bob wanting rooms, he's got to prioritize. 
he's got to figure out who is willing to say yes and sign the dotted line and pay for those rooms. Same thing on conference room availability. Um, that's even more precious to them in some cases. Um, we see a lot of people that maybe make their plans around a hotel based upon the meeting space and then try to get the rooms around it, but then sprinkle people throughout various rooms. Um, you know, you can tell people that, hey, our plan is to recover at another city, but what we've seen historically is you might find 50% of those users won't leave. And the other 50% that do show up, um, they're going to bring a lot of things with them. Cats, dogs, kids, parakeets, maybe furniture, valuable stuff. And they're going to say, okay, I'm here to work. Now what are you going to do with all this stuff? And so is your travel department or your logistics or operations, are they prepared to take on that task? Do they know what they're getting into? And do they know what to do? Something that gets missed a lot is bandwidth availability. Uh, when the tornado hit Kentucky, um, there were insurance companies that deployed, forward deployed to hotel rooms in the areas to start doing the adjustments and the claims and, and to make sure they could start getting money rolling back into that area. And what they found is they got into these hotel rooms, which there were rooms available, but then everybody in this age of iPads using YouTube to watch television, big bandwidth, there was no availability to do their work because the bandwidth was all used up. So you may get a room in a hotel or you may find a conference room, but do they have enough bandwidth capable to uh, supply all that demand? Uh, backup power may be an issue you need to look at. Obviously, when there's issues going on in the power grid, they might have to pull power from other areas. So does that hotel have backup power? Uh, what kind of power is it? Are they on main lines? How quickly would they be up if they went down? The voice system integration or continuity. Obviously, most hotels do have a telephone system in them, um, but does that system stay up and running? Are their phone lines going to go down just like yours? Maybe if they're out of area, you're probably okay. But then the next question is, do, will you be able to vector those calls, inbound calls for maybe your customers or your main suppliers? Are you going to be able to integrate with that phone system and make that phone in the conference room ring when they call your number? And how do you do that? And then there's also equipment. Obviously, most people can remember laptops. However, we saw in Hurricane Sandy, some of them don't. They don't believe that the danger is imminent, so they leave their stuff there. Or they might show up with laptops but then forget other pieces like power adapters. What about uh, printers, copiers, faxes? All those other things that you might not think are critical that show up. And then, of course, maybe your plan is to go to the hotel and you figure, oh, we'll run to Best Buy and get that equipment. Well, what happens maybe when that equipment breaks or when the CIO's laptop goes up in flames because he used the wrong power adapter? Or maybe the tongs on the power adapter got crisscrossed, short-circuited, and next thing you know, you've got a fire to deal with. That's a key question that not a lot of people understand because maybe they did go to Best Buy early on. Maybe they did get some equipment. But now all of a sudden when it breaks, now they're behind the curve because everyone else went there and got equipment. So these are some things that we can solve for people. Um, a key ingredient that we provide is something called QuickShip. So now you can see the pictures here where people have taken a hotel room and populated it with equipment. They've turned it, turned it into uh, something that was just tables and chairs, and now they have an integrated phone system. They have maybe dual flat panels. Um, they've got printers. They've got toner. They've got office supplies. And all of that can be pulled in at time. So the beauty is you're able to have this equipment on standby ready to go. And then when you need it, you can pull the trigger and it can populate. And so a customer who recently had to uh, go to Dallas had to implement this type of solution where they populated. And in this case, they populated a warehouse, their own warehouse, and then had all the equipment there. A lot of times hotels may be able to provide some limited equipment, but a key thing is, what about network devices? Um, most conference rooms are not built to put 50 or 100 people in, and therefore they don't have just simple things like network patch cabling. Uh, the cables themselves or the switches and the equipment, the routers to get that through. 
um, we can also supply supplementary bandwidth so that maybe that bandwidth at the hotel is saturated, but you can use other means such as satellite to supplement that bandwidth or maybe pull things off like maybe the voice bandwidth and make that separate. Speaking of voice, what about an independent phone system? Something that while you're in transition from the site to the relocation site, those calls are seamlessly going to the people who can answer the call. So you may have a plan to redirect to another facility, but the question is, can those people at that other facility answer the call? Uh, if you have a specialty like Spanish-speaking resources, um, if you vector it to another facility, they're going to be able to help that. So having a voice system that's seamless and allows you to move from one site to another is key. What about an independent office facility with power? You know, we can solve that, and I'll explain where you might be able to fill in a conference room, but again, we go back to that backup power question. We talked about the on-site uh, break fix. You know, using vendors um, can allow you to uh, recover that broken gear, and you don't have to worry about it. The vendor does. So when uh, that laptop doesn't work or that monitor is, is looking funny, it doesn't have the right colors, you can turn to the vendor and have that do that. And then what about simple office supplies? It's amazing how things like sticky notes and pens and paper become real critical and real uh, necessary in times of, of criticality. So what if there isn't a conference room available? What if someone beat you to it? Uh, or what if it's just not big enough? Well, now you can use things such as mobile recovery, you know, mobile trailers that are governed by the rules of DOT that can pull into a a hotel overhang like this. Um, they need a 30 by 60 foot footprint. Uh, and once they come in, uh, they don't leave any trace that they were ever there. Um, we're not drilling holes in a parking lot. Um, they come self-sustained. They have fuel. They have a generator on board. They have air conditioning. All the network cabling, all of that, as well as all the infrastructure is right there. So identifying maybe where can you put a trailer like this is something that you can think through. But at the same time, it's very flexible in that maybe the hotel, which we'll see in a bit, uh, has a larger parking lot next to it, or a mall, or a church. So it gives you a lot of flexibility to be able to deal with the situation. So when a customer has solutions like this, and they have that flexibility, one key component is the communications. So if this mobile does show up, or if they're going to go inside of a conference room, then how do they connect back into their data? How do they get those voice lines to go through? And there's three different ways or ideas or tools that are used. Uh, one is a wired connection. Now this might be a pre-built external wired connection at a facility that has a, an external network connection. Maybe it's fiber, typically. It might be a piece of copper, like a CAT6 copper cable. And then it uh, is maybe in a weatherproof box, and we can connect to that. Maybe plan A is we can't get close to the building, so we need to use a wireless point-to-point. -point. Or maybe it's a regional outage and we have to go to satellite. So we'll talk about the pros and cons of each. In a wired connection, uh, the mobiles come with a 100-foot umbilical on them already so that we can roll up and connect into a wiring closet. So in cases where customers have maybe a small strip center as a backup site where they're replicating data, but they don't have workspace for people to work in, they can actually have a mobile trailer pull up and connect into that. Now they might have a pre-built uh, hitching post like I talked about before, or in cases like you can see here on the right, they might drill a hole through the wall. It's actually bubble wrap stuffed in the hole there. Um, you can prop open doors. Uh, they'll put a security guard there for security. Obviously, it's not perfect, um, but it does what they need to do at time. Now, that works great in the scenario where you can connect directly to it. And there are some hotels where you can. You can go in through a side door and prop a door open and connect into their wiring closet. Or maybe if we're lighting up uh, the building and a mobile's not involved, we can bring in our network devices and put them inside of their wiring closet. So that's always plan A, but there are some scenarios 
where we can't park the mobile right next to the hotel. Maybe the hotel actually has a problem with that. They don't want that. And they prefer it maybe further back in their parking lot. And that's where you can go to a wireless point-to-point. -point. Uh, in the, the case where we were talking about today, uh, that customer actually had to deploy to the back side of a parking lot of a hotel. And in this particular picture here, and ironically this is in Denver, uh, this actually was a few years ago, um, you can see the office building on the left, and you can see uh, the antenna that's placed at time. Now this antenna can be placed on the roof. Uh, we bring the tripod, or it can be placed in an office uh, and pointed out the window. And that uh, wireless antenna then connects uh, to another wireless antenna, which the picture on the right is what it looks like down in those trees. So the mobile unit is sitting down in the trees, and you can see the red circle at the top of the building. That's where this other antenna is. Now these can go up to a half mile line of sight, even further in some cases, but half mile is a, is a good distance to get you some uh, space to move. And it provides a point-to-point a -point bridge connection. This is not a Wi-Fi. You're not opening this up, so hey, broadcasting to everybody, hey, join my network. No, this is connecting to this specific uh, device, and you can get up to gigabit speeds on this. And so now the users, which are in a mobile trailer, can be connected uh, either to the building, either to your hotel, uh, and they will then be feeling, as far as a network is concerned, like they're on that network in the building. So that's a scenario that might be used where maybe there's so much debris around the building that you can't get to it. Windows got blown out or roof got blown off. Or a hotel says, uh, we can't let you park that close to the building. Uh, even for some scenarios, we have actually put one of these wireless antennas on the balcony or even in a hotel room and pointing out the window at the mobile. So you're actually connecting via a hotel room uh, and then into the hotel's infrastructure. So the wired connection and the wireless point-to-point -point are scenarios where you do have connectivity. What if that hotel bandwidth is saturated? Or what if you want to light up another building? How can you get some bandwidth into that, maybe if it's a regional outage? And that's where satellite comes into play. So satellite obviously uh, needs a clear view of the southern sky. Um, whether you're in a a cornfield in Illinois or a beach in Florida, it's still going to work. Um, it provides a constant connection. So this is hitting uh, geosynchronous satellites in the sky and not moving satellites across the horizon. Um, you can get plenty of bandwidth on these. Uh, we have seen call centers uh, that are easily running 200, 500 seats across satellite, uh, taking live calls. The beauty about satellite, obviously, is the fact that it's always there. And in many cases, though, we'll transition customers maybe from satellite to wireless or to kitchen post as the, the scenario unfolds. Um, because as you know, a restoration can come fast or slow, and it, it just depends completely on the scenario and the situation. Yes, there are some concerns about latency with satellite, but that's why you test devil's in the details, and you don't know what the devil will be until you test. And so that latency is present, but after you get people to understand what effect that's going to have on voice conversations, once they get used to it, it takes about 15 minutes, they're fine. And so now you have a solution and pieces to provide a connectivity solution um, to get customer back up and running. So in the particular case where you had a customer who had a hurricane heading their way, they had time to think about it. They were able to relocate to a hotel that Michelle will tell you how they were able to guarantee and get locked in. And then they were able to place a mobile in the back parking lot. All of their IT infrastructure was there waiting for them when they got them. So uh, printers, copiers, phone system, connectivity, all of that's ready to go. Some of the employees brought their own uh, laptops. Some of them did not. They could use uh, desktops provided or laptops provided. And they were able to get everything rolling. And then they're doing this while their families are safe. Uh, little Johnny and, and 
and is swimming in the pool. Uh, Mom is happy because she's hanging out in the room watching soap operas, and they're safe. So um, it, it created a solution that was very flexible for them so that they could recover to a hotel of their choosing and in many cases at time make these decisions and figure out where to go. But of course, a big question comes up, which is, well, how do I know the hotel I pick is going to be available? And that's where Michelle's expertise comes in. And so she's going to help us understand how can you guarantee hotel rooms, or Michelle, does it just magically happen? Hotels always have space for you, don't they? Oh, of course. Yes, there's nothing they like more than, than having rooms go unsold at night. <laughs> Um, good morning, everybody. I'm Michelle Lowther with Continuity Housing, and wanted to spend a few minutes before we talk about our specific case study this morning. Um, and I'm having a little technical difficulty here switching to my computer, but before we do that, I wanted to talk to you about another case study so that we can contrast. You know, someone who didn't have a plan, who wasn't prepared to, um, you know, with with advance arrangements at hotels to house their folks and what that translated to for them in terms of cost, in terms of um, you know, manpower that they had to spend handling this issue, et cetera. So there was all sorts of, of chaos involved for this company. This company is a major U.S. bank. It's one of the top five banks in the U.S. And um, I would say that it's going to be very interesting, I think, when you, you see that last cost button especially. But first, I would like to see which bucket you all might fall into. You know, I think everyone falls into one of three main buckets of, of describing where you are with your housing solution as part of your overall business continuity plan. The first would be no housing program in place. You know, you really don't have anything. You think you can kind of do it on the fly, but, you know, there isn't anything formal that's, that's set up right now. The second would be, you know, you've thought about it and you really believe that because you can make your own travel arrangements for vacation, let's say, or for your business travel, you know, conventions that you might attend, customers you might visit, things like that, that you can just get on the internet and make reservations when the time comes. Very dangerous assumption being made there, if that's, if that's your bucket. Um, because, you know, when a hotel is in, in the mode of receiving people that are deploying, people that are might be even are evacuating the city if that's been ordered for the general public, everything is chaos for them. And um, as Steve mentioned before, you know, Bob, everybody's friend at the hotel, <laughs> um, is in a position to be everybody's friend, not just yours, not just mine. And so there needs to be some advance arrangement in place, some agreement, some contracts, everything in writing, everything guaranteed so that you're not one of the many you know, you're not just like everybody else burning up their phone line asking the same question and also being um, subjected to price gouging possibly or not so favorable terms in your contract, things like that. You're one of the few because you have set everything up in advance and this doesn't become a stress point for you. The third bucket is we have something in place already. You know, we already have an agreement with the hotel. If you guys fall into this bucket, anybody on the call, I would say that today is most important for you because you might have a false sense of security about what your arrangement really is. Um, hopefully, if you, if you fall into this category, you can look at your agreement after this, this webinar and see if anywhere it says based on availability. If it does, you don't have the guarantee that you, that you want here. You don't have the guarantee you think you do. Um, and there are reasons that hotels put that in, and, and we can talk about that in a minute, but I just want to make sure if anybody does have something in place already, you take a look at what you have and, and be sure that that language is not included. No matter which category we're in, I think we all have the same wish list of items. We want to know that we have a place to go, that the rooms are as ironclad guaranteed as possible. We want our deployment to run smoothly so that we don't spend an exorbitant amount of, of labor hours and money, you know, going towards something that could have been much more smoothly handled had we done something in advance. And we want our responders to be happy. We want their families to be happy. Steve talked a lot about a sense of safety for those families, and it's a big deal for them to leave their homes when the area, if, if we're talking like today, we're talking about a hurricane, 
in this scenario, the area is in a weather crisis. They're leaving their home behind, <clears throat> excuse me, behind and they're not sure what they're going to come home to. So they've packed everybody up, uh, you know, grandma, kids, pets, <laughs> valuables and furniture, like Steve said. And, you know, our job then as, as their steward, as their advocate, becomes trying to make them as comfortable as possible. And really the goal of that is twofold. It's not just from a human resource standpoint, but also so they'll get the work done. I mean, those people have been chosen, have volunteered, or have been selected so that their critical job functions can continue. So we want to keep them happy. And of course, we want to contain costs. And the best way to do that is to have it all laid out in advance, um, to negotiate with a hotel before, you know, if you're looking, if you're talking about a seasonal, a weather type event like we are today, before hurricane season even starts, this stuff is long since negotiated. And the reason for that is we're then not um, one of the many. Like I was saying before, we're not negotiating from a point of weakness when there is a surge in demand. We're negotiating from a point of leverage, from a point of strength, when we're just a promise of possible business for them. And it's a very different picture to paint for the hotels. So for the major U.S. bank, we're talking about the 2008 hurricanes that were pretty much back to back. Hurricane Gustav and Hurricane Ike, both, you know, large-scale events, and they did have warning. You know, the, the, I guess, silver lining, I suppose, with a hurricane is you can see it coming for the most part. And yes, they do draw that spider web <laughs> that Steve showed us earlier, which eventually becomes a cone. But, you know, still, we, we have the time to watch the storm as it moves inland um, or toward the coast and prepare. So what they needed if something were to hit their area, was 200 rooms, and that included rooms for their actual responders, plus some additional rooms for family members. I think in this case, the, the company could have up to two rooms per employee. Their protocol and their, their plan for housing was that they were going to utilize their internal travel department, and that that travel department would handle everything for them at the time of the crisis. Now, this is a, this is a major, major bank, right? And this is also a major, major travel agency. So we're talking about two organizations with a ton of leverage. Let's just see how that goes. <laughs> okay. So what actually ended up happening for them was their responders, you know, they got on the phone early just like everybody else, but their responders were getting on the road and they still did not have blocks of rooms secured. And so you are a lot of risks there. You know, you're spreading your people out all over the place. Um, they might start to panic and make their own reservations, in which case, from the hotel standpoint, they're receiving reservations that could be, you know, one of three. Like, if I'm the one that is deploying and I feel like my organization has not come through for me and gotten me an accommodation, yet I'm expected to show up for work, I'm going to make my own reservation. But I'm also sitting in contra flow traffic. And going from Houston to Dallas, like our case study today, <clears throat> which is typically a four-hour trip, might take me 20 hours. So I'm going to make reservations at several stops along the way because I don't know for sure how far I will get, you know, and if I'll make it all the way to Dallas or not. So from the hotel standpoint, you know, they're getting reservations that may or may not be real, which is never a good position for them to be in. So they were still securing these rooms when there were people on the road. Because of that, they couldn't reach people. You know, the cell phone service was spotty at best. They couldn't communicate with those responders. So it was, it was a very bad situation in that standpoint. But also, they didn't even have all of the details for each person that was deploying. They didn't know if it was a family of two or a family of six. You know, that makes a difference in how many beds have to be in the room. They didn't know if pets were going or not. They certainly didn't have advance arrangements with hotels to ensure that they would accommodate pets, so that was a problem as well. And the biggest problem was that because their travel agency was a vendor, as opposed to part of their own organization, you know, they didn't have the same vested interest. And those agents weren't working the 24-7 shift that was required during this crunch time. That can be a very dangerous situation. Yes, they are experts in travel. However, they're not on your team <laughs> in the same way. So what happened then is they were rolling over to other call centers because this was a very large travel agency rolling over to other call centers, other agents were trying to step in and handle it, but they were in other countries. Um, it, it just was very difficult to get the task done. Communication was rough. They were signing contracts on the fly, um, which means that they didn't have an opportunity to really leverage 
their, their normal buying power for either the agency or the bank. Uh, they weren't getting the best terms that they could. But more importantly, it was hard to track down someone internally within the bank who had the signing authority to sign off on these dollar amounts. So the longer it took them to get a contract signed, the more likely it was that they would lose the rooms because the hotel you know, gives you a couple of hours. And they say, look, you can commit to me by 1 o'clock or I'm selling them to the next, the next group. So very difficult to get that, that paperwork done as well. Then once people actually got on site, they had problems with various things. Shuttle service was one of them. And if you imagine you know, an employee that packs up their family and their pets and everything else and they get in one car and they go to their location, their alternate location for work, then they turn around the next morning and they take that car to work, then who's left or what's left for transportation for the family? Well, maybe there's a hotel shuttle, but if you have a sold out hotel because suddenly there's been this surge in demand, that shuttle's not going to be able to get everything for everyone. So that became problematic for them. Um, having catered food in because they didn't have anything at the work site, that was an issue. Hotels did not know that pets were coming and they were kicking people out because the people were coming with pets. And then because they were kicking people out, they would have to then find another room for that person at another hotel. Um, and then sometimes people would do, make that decision on their own, just go to another hotel because their buddy was staying over there. The bank would end up paying twice for the same person at Hotel A and then simultaneously on the same night, Hotel B. So very, very messy when it came to invoices. Um, messy from the standpoint of knowing where your people are and ensuring that they're safe and can get to work, but messy from the standpoint of billing as well. So speaking of billing, let's talk about cost. 12 people, 12 full-time people working for five weeks solid on the two deployments. Now, each deployment was about a week, so that gives you an idea. You know, they had an additional three weeks of work on the back end, and, and I would say maybe probably three or four days on the front end before the first storm hit. So five weeks, 12 people, calculate the hours there, calculate the cost internally of that, and the cost of, of the jobs that they normally would be doing not getting done for a full five weeks. That's a lot. They did have to stand up a hotel hotline at the last minute to handle all sorts of employee questions. This can be, you know, where's the closest Walmart? I need some, some baby formula. <laughs> this can be, I want to take my family to dinner because we're going stir crazy in this hotel. This can be, the hotel is charging my credit card erroneously. All sorts of issues happen um, in this kind of a situation. So they, they had to put together a group of people and quickly put a hotline together for employees to, uh, to call into. It cost them over three million dollars, my goodness, for two deployments. So, you know, over a two-week period of time, that's, that's exorbitant. Now, it did include their per diem that each employee was allowed for meals um, and other expenses, and it included mileage reimbursement. Everybody drove, almost everybody drove, but the primary culprit there is lodging. That's over a thousand dollars per room per day, which is absolutely ridiculous. Doesn't have to be that way. So I wanted to show you this first before we talk about the group um, that, that Steve and I were working on, which left Houston, went to Dallas, much smoother deal. Just to give you a point of contrast in case this is not something that you guys have ever been through before yourselves. So the first difference for our client is that they make one phone call. You know, they don't have 12 full-time people <laughs> sitting around for five weeks trying to handle this. They call Continuity Housing and it's done. You know, we have done all the work on the front end, so it's a very smooth um, evacuation, a very smooth deployment of personnel. There's no scrambling around like the bank, and I, I use that word a lot, scrambling, but that really is what it is. It can be such chaos. So no scrambling around, and most importantly, the business continuity team was able to focus on their real jobs. You guys have enough on your plates. When that's all going on, you don't need to try to become temporary travel agents. Um, you know, there's, there's a skill set to every industry, and there's definitely a skill set to negotiating these hotel contracts. And unless you speak that language, that hotelese, what have you, you know, it can be difficult to secure what you want to secure and what is most advantageous for you to secure uh, without that knowledge. So you want to make sure that you guys are doing your core jobs and you bring in somebody else um, either internally and, and set that all out in advance or externally 
that knows in advance exactly what the parameters are and, and can speak that language and get that done for you. Uh, they were able to get a cost estimate in advance. The room rates were all locked in. So, you know, up in Dallas, we had gone through, we had negotiated agreements with hotels. You know, we, we start on the front end by sitting down with the client and saying, okay, let's be strategic. You know, let's not be reactive. Let's look at where you want to recover. Do you have real estate? Do you not? Do you want to use a mobile recovery unit? If so, then that determines the kind of property that we can look at. You know, for example, we have another client who is using a mobile recovery unit, and we know that we need to get that 60 by 30 square foot space in the parking lot that Steve mentioned earlier for their unit, for their workspace. So we know that when we're doing an RFP, we have to select hotels that have flat parking lot space or adjacent parking lot space or nearby parking lot space that they have access to with some degree of exclusivity so that they will be able to provide that footprint and we can set up the unit you know, at, at time. So we want to make sure that you know, all that kind of stuff is done in advance. But because we've done that work, you know what it's going to cost. So there are no surprises there. And then you're done. You know, they, they called us. They, they gave us the green light. And then they didn't hear from us again until we gave them confirmation numbers for all the names on their list. The benefit of that, and that, that happens usually same day, depending on what time they call. Um, the benefit of that is their folks knew a day or two before they were leaving where they were going. So contrast that to people on the road in the car with spotty cell phone service who, who didn't know what hotel they needed to show up at. Second piece, I touched on this a second ago, is the work is done up front. So lots of pieces to this. You know, it can be very paperwork heavy on the front end, but you want to get all those guarantees in writing. So there is a way to approach a hotel um, to make it make sense for them to hold rooms for you on a guaranteed basis. The reason, if you've ever made that phone call and, and you know, asked for something just kind of on a what if, we want to know that if something happens, you will have 20 rooms for us, let's say. It, it's hard for a hotel to answer that, to even address that, because every night, you know, they lose the opportunity for that night to sell those rooms because a room and a conference room are both perishable items. So think about, um, you know, the fact that a hotel might have 300 rooms and eight conference rooms. Let's say tonight comes and goes and they sell five of the conference rooms today and they sell 250 of the rooms. Well, the rest, those other three conference rooms, those other 50 guest rooms are lost to them. And because they didn't fill them tonight, that's it. They don't get another, they can't manufacture another date, <laughs> another widget, you know. Um, they don't have another opportunity to make revenue, make profit on those rooms for this date. So that's why when we call them and we ask for a what if and we can't give them the dates in advance because we don't know what they'll be, they can't really address that for us. Now there are ways to do it where it works for both and you spread your risk, which is wonderful, um, but that's what you're looking for is a guarantee in writing that the rooms will be held for you. Contract terms are all pre-negotiated, which we talked about a little bit already, and we established credit. So, you know, that's one thing that can help give you a leg up. If you already have credit established, billing privileges established with a hotel, then that makes you a more attractive piece of business because they vetted you in already as someone who's going to pay the bills, um, which becomes very important when their rooms become even more precious as demand surges during a crisis event. We also inspect the hotels on the front end, and this can be, you know, a variety of, of angles. It can be amenities. It can be general location. It can be, you know, the parking lot surface area itself to make sure the recovery unit will fit. And it can also be safety related. So we do all of that up front, roll it into a report, and give that to you. So our client had all that knowledge in advance. They had the list of hotels, they had the cost, they had the guarantee in writing, and they had it all set up so that when they made that phone call to us and they decided to pull the trigger on a deployment, all that we had to do was just allocate their rooming list across the hotels and come back to them with confirmation numbers. Doing the contract in advance is going to save a lot of time on the back end. You know, you're not looking for someone who has the signing authority, for example. But also, you know, the hotels are, are pretty tough to reach, <laughs> as I'm sure you can imagine, during that kind of a time period. They have locked their booking channels down. They've closed everything out. And you typically have to go through a general manager or a director of sales in order to get inventory. Um, 
you know, you want to be able to reach that person, but if, if those are the only people on property that can let go of rooms, you can imagine that they're very busy, very hard to reach. So, you know, going back and forth with them to negotiate a contract is not going to be an effective use of your time. It's not going to happen quickly. So you want to save that time and do it all on the front end. Also, because you're doing it in advance, not during a crisis when demand has surged already, then you're able to get some more favorable terms. Your rates are locked. We talked about that. And you can include provisions that are, that are more um, business continuity specific. You know, a hotel always has a group contract. They always have a template. Every one of them does. And they can send that to you and they say, this is what you sign if you want to block the rooms. But that's not what's best for you. You know, what's best for you is to come up with your own contract, and that's what we did for this client in Houston. We have our own contract. We present that to all of the hotels, and they all sign the same thing. Now, there might be some negotiating on terms here and there, but they all include provisions, for example, to stay late if it's a catastrophic event, or, you know, opposite of that, to leave early if the event um, isn't as big as they thought it would be and they can get back home sooner without extensive financial repercussions, and that's important, especially given the notion of a room at a hotel being a perishable good, like we talked about before. You want to be able to negotiate better rates if you do have to extend your stay, and things like that all need to be included up front in writing in your contract. The other thing that is, is helpful to make your de uh, deployment very efficient is to pre-sign the contract. So then again, you're not trying to find somebody with that signing authority. It's already done. What happens then is the hotel signs and continuity housing signs, and then it's executed. You know, we, we continuity housing, become the check and balance, but, you know, so that a hotel can't fill in blanks on a pre-signed contract that your organization has done, you know, and then hold you accountable. Um, and then we, of course, would require written notice from you, but it makes it very effective for you. You're pulled out of that process completely, and it's the quickest way for you to get from your phone call to us to your confirmation numbers. The last thing is we provided on-site support. So remember the hotel hotline that we talked about where, you know, employees had all sorts of questions. Think instead, imagine instead of sending a representative in advance, you know. So now the person that is deploying on your uh, organization's behalf gets to the hotel, they get a welcome packet, and it has a letter from the general manager. And, you know, they express concern about what the employee is going through. And, you know, they express their commitment to help them in any way possible. Um, there are maps to the work location if it is off-site real estate. Or there are hours for, um, you know, anything else like the pool, the fitness center, the mobile recovery unit itself, anything like that. It's, it's a much different sense of arrival. We can also help them with, you know, where they can go to a pharmacy, where they can go to dinner, where they can get supplies for their pets, things like that. Then we also wear another hat where we can troubleshoot hotel issues as they arise, and they always, always do. So we want to be sure that hotels are compliant with the contracts that we have sent them. Um, ours are usually a little more um, rigid <laughs> than others, certainly than the ones the hotels would provide on their own. So we need somebody there to manage that process. And in managing that process, they'll do a daily audit. You know, who was supposed to be in that hotel last night? And who does the hotel actually show was in the hotel last night? And, and are there any discrepancies there? If there are, we come to the client and we say, hey, we're missing this person, and we try to find them and, you know, figure out where they've gone, make sure the hotel or the organization, excuse me, isn't paying twice for the same room, things like that. But our client then knew where all their employees were, and that did happen. They, you know, they would flip from one hotel to another for a personal reason. Um, and, you know, that helped them, the company, know where everyone was at all times. It also helped us keep our bills nice and clean. So, you know, there are lots of, lots of little nuances, lots of things that we can't get to in the scope of today's webinar. But I think, you know, both Steve and I would have some main points, some main takeaways that we'd want to make sure you guys had at the end of today. So I'm going to turn it back to Steve real quick so that he can talk about his, and then I'll come back to you in just a second. So thanks, Michelle. I hope that cleared up uh, a key question. It's a question I always wondered for many years when people would say, oh, um, I've got a hotel. Okay. And I just knew all of the things that Michelle talked about and, and wondered, how are they going to do that? Um, I, I, when I was in the Marine Corps, a drill instructor would always scream at us, uh, 
You can imagine what that was like. And he would always say, uh, the more you sweat in peace, the less you'll bleed in war. And I always thought that was an interesting phrase to move in and, and transition to our world. And I would say, the more you sweat before the disaster, the less your company is going to bleed during the disaster. And the solutions that we're providing today, I think, are, are key to that component. Um, doing all this thing ahead of time, knowing where you're going to go, having something locked in, knowing that your network staff is already familiar with the satellite connectivity, so even though the satellite's getting dropped into a field in Plano, Texas, they're going to be able to connect right back into their infrastructure. So what the, the company realized after they had gotten through the motions and, and doing these contracts beforehand, the hurricane is fairly easy in the sense of you know it's coming. You've got time to plan. And that can be good or bad because uh, in some ways it's good because you're able to call around and get things, but that means everybody else does too. So you've got to be the first ones to the punch and, and make sure you get that hotel locked in unless you're using a solution uh, with continuity housing. But they also realized now that they had a solution that was completely flexible, even like in the West Texas explosion. You can imagine sitting here right now, wherever you are, and all of a sudden, boom, it's, you're in it. You're in the disaster at that moment. There was no notification. There was, n there was nothing. You had no idea that that incident was going to happen. But now that that has already been done and all of that groundwork has been laid, now they know what to do. They know where to go. They know what to expect. They know what they're going to see. So a location to recover the business, they know that. Getting alternate hardware, they know what that's going to be. Where, where's the printer? Where's that stuff? Data access to business applications. They've already done a test and identified that whether they're connected to the hotel via wireless point-to-point -point or with a wired connection or a satellite, they're going to get to their business applications. They know that their inbound customer calls are going to be answered. You know, I see a lot of businesses that will spend a ton of money replicating data somewhere, but then when the disaster hits and you call their toll-free number, all you get is a fast, busy signal. That's never good. And then employees and their families are safe. They know they can go and they can work and do what they need to do, and their families are in the hotel. So at 5 o'clock, which they probably won't get done right at 5 in a disaster, but let's hope that, you know, 6, 7 o'clock, you know, they can back off of the work and be with their families and know that they're safe and jump in the pool with them and do that cool stuff with them. This is operational in 48 hours, so now upper management is able to answer uh, their people and their investors and say, yes, we're going to be good to go. And then it's a cost-conscious solution. You're not building a hotel and a recovery site in an off-site location and manning it and worrying about the maintenance and the costs and all that. You've got a solution in your back pocket that's ready to roll. And in that case, when a disaster hits, whether it's immediate like this picture here, um, this was actually a water main line uh, that busted in the middle of a building in their hard copy records room. And so you can imagine, how do you, how do you deal with that? That's obviously not a hurricane. You didn't see it coming. All you knew is when the first person came to work on Monday morning and he opened the front doors, water covered his ankles. So how do you deal with that? Well, these solutions with rent assist recovery and continuity housing solve those gaps, solve that problem, and get you something. Michelle, I think you've got some good points as well. I do. I have a few. Um, but, you know, I, I want to just capitalize on something that you said. You were talking about flexibility. Um, I think that's the name of the game. You know, there, there are always going to be everybody on this phone. You guys are probably the last people that need to hear this. but. You always need a backup for a backup for a backup, right? And you, there's always going to be something that you wish you would have thought of beforehand. <laughs> you know, we don't want to be that thing. We'd like that to be something else. Um, but the flexibility in both of these solutions is inherent in the way that the, the products and the programs are designed. And I think that that makes your program much more robust than it would otherwise be, um, especially if we're talking about reacting to a crisis not something that we do have a, a little forewarning about, um, you know, like a hurricane or another weather-related event. The other thing, Steve, that you said was, you know, that there's, there's a magical solution. Surely we can just, you know, do such and such. Surely we can just go to a hotel. 
And, and if nothing else, I hope that today has shown everyone that that isn't the case. You know, we, we don't have a lot of time. The, the time that we allowed for the webinar seems like a big chunk of time until we get into details and until we start talking about the what ifs. And there can be so many arms and legs to this. So I hope that that's something that everyone takes away. You know, that there isn't a magical solution and that the key, in, in addition to guaranteeing certain products and services for your organizations, the key really is to have flexibility there. Um, but you do want to have rooms guaranteed by your hotels, obviously. And that is very different than, hey, we'll help you if we can. You know, hey, we'll help you if we have something available. A very different conversation with the hotel, those two, those two distinguish themselves. Um, to have your hotels inspected according to your criteria in advance, vetted by you in advance. You know, maybe you've even had an opportunity to have a face-to-face. -face. That goes a long way with the hotels. All that's done. To enable your team, your internal team, to focus on their core continuity responsibilities. You know, everybody puts on a different hat when, when crunch time comes. And we want you to be able to fully wear that hat, fully do those responsibilities, and not have to worry about some of these other details. So that's checked off your list, too. To know and to trust that your responders are safe, um, that you know, your, your folks are as content as they can be, given the circumstances of being away from home, um, and that they're able to work. They're able to perform those critical job functions, which is the reason that they're there in the first place. Also, you know that you're able to flex based on the scale of the event. You know, is it something that's going to last a long time, or is it something that you're in and out in two days? You know, that's a different way to contract. That's a different way to, to think about everything. But if your arrangements that you've made in advance account for all possibilities, then you're covered. And you can flex and you cannot worry about the financial repercussions because those will all be mitigated as well. You have some on-site support. You know the value now of having somebody there to, to manage the human aspect of a deployment, not only for the actual employees, but for their family members as well. And you've set something up that is cost effective. You know, where hotels are concerned, you're not guaranteeing a room by buying it every night of hurricane season, you know, which is what hotels want you to do. Instead, you've come up with something that makes sense. You know, you've come up with a way to guarantee that those rooms will be available to you before they're available to anybody else. So, you know, with this list of items, you can trust that you're able to restore your business, you won't have interruptions, and your folks will be safe and happy. I think, um, Fred, you've been collecting maybe some questions during the presentation. Do you have any that you'd like to share with us? Yeah, we've actually got quite a few, but we've run a few minutes over, so let's go through four, let's go through three or four very quickly. And everybody, if, if we don't get to your, uh, to your question, we will respond to it later by email, so don't hesitate to ask a question in the, uh, the Q&A. Uh, feature in the control panel. First question I guess would be for Stephen. Uh, you showed a photo with a laptop battery fire, but what kind of fire suppression system do the MRCs have? Ah, good question. Um, they have a standard fire extinguisher in the front and in the rear of the unit, um, and there are four exits. Uh, there are always at least stairs on two of the exits, um, and then the other two you can still get out those. Uh, so that's how we deal with that. Okay, let's see. The next one, what if the city we prefer for deployment doesn't have any hotels available? Michelle, I think that's a good well, one for I, you. I'm assuming that's something that you, yeah, <laughs> I think that's up my alley. Um, I'm assuming that that would be something where you have real estate. Um, without knowing that, it's a little tough for me to answer. Let's say you do have real estate in a location and you want hotels around that location. Um, the next best thing is to either go in outlying areas, maybe within a 30-minute or a one-hour drive of that location, and then we can provide transportation, chartered transportation on a constant route. Think, um, think convention when you hear that. You know, think of set times where they run a loop among the hotels that are involved, and then get your folks back and forth to work. If it's not something where you have owned real estate, then I would suggest a mobile recovery unit. You know, then we find a market that does have abundant supply, that does have, you know, lots of, of flat surface parking lot hotels where we could put in a rents recovery mobile unit and uh, and handle it that way. Okay, two more questions. 
Uh, Stephen, what uh, what happens if the city we deploy to already has other companies that Rensys is managing resources for? How will we know if the backup equipment is not available? Sure, that's a common question in our industry. Um, we've been doing this since 1995. Um, we've been through multiple declarations. Uh, 19, excuse me, 2005 was probably the the toughest year, if you will. There was hurricanes, Katrina. Uh, Rita and Wilma, and we had 43 declarations. Um, we've never ever in our history ever told a customer that they couldn't have what was on their contract. And in 2005 specifically, we still maintain the testing schedule up in the Midwest, even though we had resources deployed. So the key to that is our flexibility to provide a bunch of support at time through our parent company called Reynolds and & Reynolds. And uh, that allows us to be very flexible, uh, expand as needed, and then when the event's over, we can go right back down. Okay, last question, and as somebody with a restaurant background, this one's kind of near and dear to my heart. It's probably more of a daytime question, so it's more of a, a question for Stephen. What about bathrooms and catering? Yeah, so in most cases, um, the facility, or in, in many cases, the hotel, you know, you can have those bathroom facilities uh, available there. If not, uh, we do work with other partners that have uh, mobile restroom trailers. So if you've been to golf tournaments, uh, you've seen these trailers. They, uh, you know, have actual stalls. They have running water. Some even have music in them and hot water. And those can connect to the mobile. We can power it up, and then they do have to find a water source or we can get a water buffalo. As far as the catering side, obviously, again, that's a benefit of a, of a hotel there, and, and Michelle's logistical crew can identify where to get food catered in, but we also have other partners that even provide mobile kitchens. So if we need those scenarios, we can get to them, although we don't own them ourselves, we have ways to, to source them. Well, great. I think that's a, a great point to go ahead and wrap it up. On behalf of Michelle and Stephen, I'd like to thank you all for attending this morning. Please do take the 30 seconds after we finish up to complete the survey that pops up because doing so will help ensure that the webinars we present in the future are the highest quality possible. For Stephen O'Neill and Michelle Lowther, I'm Fred Rogers with Continuity Housing. Thanks again, and have a great week. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.